Is vintage audio gear better or is it just more nostalgic? That's what we're going to be answering in today's video. Hey folks, I'm Gene Delasalo with Audioholics. I want to talk to you guys about vintage audio today. You know, I notice every now and then when I post a new review, whether it's a speaker product or an amplifier or receiver, people comment what in the forums or on our YouTube saying, yeah, that looks like a decent product, but my 1986 Surin Vegas speakers will walk all over that. Or my vintage Marantz receiver will just destroy the, today's modern AVR. And when I see these comments, I just kind of wonder what kind of a mindset and what kind of a framing are they putting this in? Do they objectively know this for a fact? Do they do ABX controlled listening tests? Do they do measurements on the bench? Or is it something that's more internal to them? Maybe they purchased this Pioneer or Marantz receiver from that day with their hard earned money and they have good memory connotations with those and they, and they've lived with that product over the years with good memories, maybe that's what they're holding on to. And maybe that's why they think that these products are at the pinnacle of performance that can't be beat by today's electronics. I'm not a psychologist, so I can't answer that for sure. I'm, a, I'm asking you guys if you think it's more of a vintage thing that a nostalgic thing, or if it's actual, do they believe it's better performance? So I want to relate this to audio, but before I do that, I have to give you a car analogy because you guys know I'm a huge car fan. And I look at the vintage or the muscle cars from the late 60s and 70s. This is, I think, a 1969 Ford Mustang with a 428 block engine. It was one of the bigger muscle cars of the day, one of the fastest ones on the road. It was uncommon. It wasn't typical performance that you would get in that time. This thing was, I think it did a quarter mile in 14 seconds flat, which was benchmark of the time. But by today's standard, that's not very fast. In fact, you could beat that quarter mile time with a Hyundai Sonata. Car and Driver just recently reviewed this Hyundai Sonata family sedan, and it does a quarter mile in 13.7 seconds, and it comfortably fits four or five people and it gets 25 to 30 miles per gallon as opposed to 11 miles per gallon in the Mustang. And I'm not even sure if you could fit people, adults, in that back seat or not. So just think about how cars have evolved over the time. Now, I'm not trashing this Mustang. I think it's a beautiful car. It's timeless. In fact, if I saw one of these on the road in good condition, I would turn my head and I would gawk at it and I would admire it because it's a beautiful car. I can't say that the Hyundai really gives me that kind of a... It doesn't elicit that kind of an emotional response. Maybe it'll take a couple of decades for that car to be timeless. I'm not sure. But let's look at some receivers here. I go on eBay and I look at vintage audio from time to time because I just, I enjoy it. I, I really do like knowing the history of audio. And the Pioneer SX 1980 was about the best two-channel receiver, most powerful, definitely of that decade. This came out, I believe, in 1978, and the retail on it, it was 12 or 1300 bucks. It was rated at 270 watts a channel at 0.03% THD. This was uncommon performance of that day. This took a lot. This took a big power supply. I think it had 12 output devices per channel. They threw everything but the kitchen sink at this thing. And, and by today's standards, it's actually a pretty good product. But is it worth 7,500 bucks? Even if you adjust for inflation, that's way beyond the inflationary adjustment that you would put on a $1,300 product. And then you have to wonder what kind of a condition is it in? Did they recap it? Is the power supply in good condition? Are the transistors in good condition? And you wonder $7,500 for a product like that. Imagine what you can get for $7,500 today you could get a separate solution that'll just stomp this thing, a separate amplifier and a preamplifier will have lower noise and distortion and more functionality. And a perfect example of that is take the Anthem STR integrated amp. This costs way less than 7,500 bucks and it has almost as much power as that Pioneer and it has a state-of-the-art DAC in it 
So you could plug all your digital sources. You could control this thing with a remote control because the Pioneer didn't even have a remote control. And you have the ability to control it from your phone with an app. And it's got Anthem Arc Room Correction, which is game changing to fix and linearize your base. And you could plug a subwoofer in with base management if you want to extend the low frequency effects of your music. So this is way more functional by today's standards than the Pioneer receiver, costs less money, brand new, better performance. And you wonder why people are still holding on to these vintage receivers and why they're still getting a pretty penny for them. And in fact, if you look at some of the modern, less expensive integrated amplifiers like a Yamaha AS801, I measured this thing and this is about $1,000 and this is really good performance. It's an honest 100 watts a channel with both channels driven with 0.002% THD plus N. It's a great sounding product that has bass management and a digital USB input. So again, you can get modern electronics that perform exceedingly well with more functionality than you can with that vintage stuff. And that Pioneer that I showed you, that was an outlier because most of the receivers of that day, the Marantz's, the, even the Yamahas, they were not that high power. They were at best 80 to 100 watts and they had much higher distortion. So the performance of those products were nothing like what you're seeing today. And I often see people saying, I could take a $500 receiver, a two channel receiver from 1978 and it'll destroy a, a seven or nine channel $500 receiver of today. And in my opinion, that's not a fair comparison. Number one, you're not adjusting for inflation. Number two, you're asking a multi-channel receiver with digital inputs and HDMI functionality and Dolby licensing. You're asking that to compete with a dedicated two-channel receiver that's the same price, not adjusting for inflation. That's not an apples to apples comparison. If you're gonna make that kind of comparison, you need to compare a two-channel receiver from that day versus a two-channel receiver from today and performance because the electronics are so much better today, the silicone is so much better, the output devices, the power supplies, you're going to get better performance today dollar per dollar. But I want to talk to you guys about loudspeakers because that's where the technological evolution really progressed over the last couple of decades. And it's all based on Transducer technology has gotten a lot better, but also our understanding of psychoacoustics, much in part to the scientists at Harman. You have guys like Dr. Floyd Toole and Dr. Sean Olive. They led pioneering research over decades to understand objectively how to make a speaker sound more pleasing to people based on how it measures. So I want to show you a product that was from the 70s that we not exist today because we know better. This is a vintage Pioneer pair of speakers. And look, I'm not knocking. If you've got this speaker and you have it and you enjoy it, more power to you. But the reality, the objective fact of a speaker like this is this is an acoustic nightmare. You can't put tweeters on opposite ends of the cabinet like that if they're sharing the same bandwidth and they're much further apart than the wavelengths of those drivers that are producing the sound as well as the mid ranges. And I don't know what the hell that is in the middle. It's some type of super horn. Maybe it's a port. I don't know, but this thing is an acoustic nightmare. There's tons of comb filtering going on. Plus you've got so much baffled diffraction because those drivers are recessed into the cabinet with that wood paneling all around it. This is not a good sounding speaker. Yes, it'll produce bass. Yes, it'll play loud, but it's not going to give you any of the imaging characteristics or sound staging that you're going to get with modern speakers just stuff that you couldn't do in that era and you know it's interesting when you look at ebay again this is a a classic jbl design this was used in studios back in the 70s maybe even late 60s the jbl l 100s now for its time it was a good speaker but there it's a severely limited design it doesn't particularly have very deep bass the paper cone tweeter is too large to produce high frequencies accurately, especially off access. And look at the price, 3,400 bucks for a restored pair of speakers that with 40 or 50 year old driver technology, JBL sells an updated version of the speaker and it's not a whole lot more money. 
And this is a superior product in every aspect. You got a much better driver technology. You've got a real dome tweeter with a waveguide on it to match the directivity of the mid range and give you great on and off axis performance. You've got just much higher dynamics of a speaker like this with better power handling. So if you're into that vintage look, maybe look at the more modern era of electronics based on grounded science. If you care about accuracy of sound reproduction, and if you don't have a big budget, but you want to stay in the JBL name, let's face it, I'm a huge JBL fan. I grew up with them. I owned a pair of JBL speakers in the early 90s, the LX44s. I loved those speakers when I was in college. But if you don't have that kind of budget and you want to have the JBL name, they've got modern speakers that are more affordable. The Studio 590s are about a thousand bucks a pair. This is a superior product to that old L100 with those paper tweeters. This thing's got a really excellent waveguide on its horn. It's got good output. It's got dual 8-inch drivers. This measures well. It sounds good. This is more along the lines if you're a JBL fan and you want to stick with something that's based on modern science, you look at a speaker like that. Now, I was a big Sirwin Vega fan you know, in my high school time, I love those red surrounds on the woofers. I still like the look of it. I owned a pair of D2s, which were 10 inch two way. This was the speaker I salivated for. This was the D9. It had a 15 inch driver with dual sixes and a piezoelectric mid range horn tweeter. And I wanted these speakers. But in reality, these were not a very good speaker. They were more of a party speaker. They thumped. They had lots of chest pounding bass. They were very efficient, so they didn't need a lot of amplifier power to play loud. But when you look and you examine the internals, this motor structure is pretty anemic for a 15-inch driver. In fact, I see 6-inch, 8-inch uh, bass drivers that have bigger magnet structures than this. And the linearity of the response is not a very long throw driver. The voice coil is not very big. It just doesn't have a really long throw on a driver. And you compare it to today's modern driver. Look at the RSL Speedwoofer 10S Mark II. This is a $450, $500 sub. That's a 10-inch driver, and the magnet structure is at least double the size of what you saw in the Sermon Vega. It's got a vented pole piece. It's got venting behind the spider. It's got a much larger surround, a much longer throw driver, much more linear response. So if you're trying to put together a system that has really good accuracy, you could do it for not that much money. And I'll give you an example of a speaker that's incredibly accurate today. The Paradigm Premier 800Fs. These are a beautiful sounding speaker. They image like bastards. They have very accurate tonality. They play loud. They don't have the greatest bass response. In fact, they've got a speaker that's cheaper, the 8000F, um, the SE series, the monitor series. Those are the answer to the Sermon Vega today. Those have triple three, three eight-inch drivers, almost as much cone area as a 15, maybe like a 14-inch driver, but it also has a superior tweeter and a much better mid-range performance, and you get your full range sound. Or you can get the premieres, like I was saying, which is a more accurate, more tonally neutral speaker, as you can see in our measurements and our reviews, and you pair it with a Speedwoofer 10S, maybe one or two of those, and that'll blow any vintage speaker system out of the water, regardless of price of that day. Just so much better imaging, much more clarity in the mid-range, especially. A lot of those speakers just didn't have very good mid-range, and you want a speaker that actually sounds good for every seat, not just for a very narrow listening area. And then if you want a speaker that has more bass output, something like the Polk R700, this is a great design. It's a great example of a speaker that gives you that full range performance that maybe you liked from the vintage era speakers, but a much more updated look and a much better sound and more accurate sound. You know, it reminds me of when people make the argument that vintage is better. Would you really use a Commodore 64 today? And guys, I grew up on the Commodore. I loved this computer to death. I played it like there was no tomorrow. But by today's standards, it's primitive. 8-bit, 64K RAM, 1 megahertz processing speed, a 1200 baud modem. It would take me a half hour to download literally a 100K file to play a video game. Compared to today's modern gaming system, 
There's just no comparison, as you guys know. You couldn't be watching this video on a Commodore 64. Give me some comments down below. Are you into vintage audio gear? What's your favorite decade of audio? Is it the 70s, 80s, the 90s? Tell me the equipment you own, if you have any emotional connection to a particular loudspeaker or receiver, or if you got one killer deal restoring some of this vintage gear. Because let's face it, I would love to see one of these old Marantz receivers with the blue panel on the front with the VU meters. Is it worth three or $4,000? No, but if you could get one for maybe four or 500 fully restore it, the cool factor for vintage is really off the charts. I have to agree with that. But from a performance standpoint, modern electronics, modern loudspeaker designs, the it's just, it's moved the needle so far. It, it amazes me today, the kind of performance that we're getting. This is kind of a renaissance, in my opinion. You can get an incredible pair of bookshelf speakers today for four or 500 bucks, an incredible pair of towers for a thousand. And you can even buy some of this stuff used for even less. And just, it's hard to get a bad performing product today. Whereas back in the 70s, 80s, and even the 90s, the performance was all over the map. So guys, I hope you found this video useful. Don't forget about our Patreon channel at patreon.com slash audiohawks. We appreciate your support. You get direct access to me if you want to suggest video topics or ask questions. And until next time, my friends, keep listening.